music is just, I still think it's the most powerful universal language in the world. It's amazing how a three and a half minute song can completely change somebody's life. People pick up their burdens and their stressors and they, they bring them to God through worship. God meets them where they're at. Michael, you, you have been there since the beginning of my faith journey and for so many other people. And I remember as a young man, it was just coming to this, this realization that I wasn't the only one who thought that the gospel was life-changing and your music and the lyrics in those songs gave me a whole community of people that I could relate to as a brand new Christian. All the people that were packed into the arenas, everybody singing your songs. I was like, this is the greatest thing. I found the greatest thing in the world. It's called Christian music. And you were right there at the heart of it. Well, thank you, Kirk. I, you know, this is the crazy music is just, I still think it's the most powerful universal language in the world. It's amazing how a three and a half minute song can completely change somebody's life. And so the fact that I've been doing it for uh, now I'm, it's four decades. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm just so grateful. And you get to see transformation. You get to see the music just completely impact people's lives. And it just, for me, it doesn't get any better than that. So Michael, you've been traveling all over the world. Where, where in the world has Michael W. Smith been lately? Well, I was in Vietnam uh, about a week and a half ago. That was incredible uh heading to europe romania poland uh budapest wow. uh, south africa in june and we'll in in the european tour in rome so just yeah it's just it's crazy you know I, I never imagined that my music would find its way in every continent and it really wasn't the pop stuff kirk it was really the worship album that came out on 9 11 that's when actually that record was released in 2001 uh September 11th. And so those songs from that record literally are sung all around the world. And, and I still get chills. You know, you're in Vietnam and they're singing Agnes Day in Vietnamese and English at the same time. Mm. You know, it's like, it's incredible. And you go to Brazil and you have 50,000 kids breaking out in Agnes in Portuguese. It's just, and you just cry. I just stopped playing. I just, <laughs> I'm undone by the whole thing. And yeah, it's just, it's pretty remarkable. Wow. It really is. Well, well Michael, I want to talk about a, an incredible project that you're a part of in the next segment. Uh, but right now, I'd like to really focus in on the beauty and the theology of creativity and music and worship. Michael, so many of us have been, have been moved by your music and inspired by your lyrics. But, but what do you find inspires you the most to be able to write these kinds of songs? Well, lots of things. I mean, obviously, my family have, have inspired so many songs, world events, you know, 9-11, Columbine, mm. those kind of things are sort of push my button when I can't seem to articulate what I'm feeling. They sort of comes out my fingers on a piano. Yeah, you know, I'm just inspired by nature in itself, you know. I mean, the stars, I mean, just the, the beauty of God's creation. I'll never forget when I, we have a Bradford pear, it's a very popular tree in Tennessee, and it was in full bloom. And I pulled up beside it, probably had, had pulled up so many times uh, and seen that tree. And all of a sudden, one day, I just completely lost it. I know it sounds bizarre. It sounds crazy. Um, but literally, the beauty of the tree, I just went, oh, my gosh, God, you are so good. And so, you know, I just the songs fall out of the sky. They still just fall out of the sky, and I catch them. It amazes me that you can take lyrics and a melody and blend them together and make a song. Can you just give us a, a little glimpse of what that process looks like? How do you do that? I mean, how, do you start with the melody? Do you start with the, with the lyrics? How does it work for you? Most of the time, it's, I mean, the, my favorite way to do it is really music first. I mean, there always is a melody. Friends is a different thing. When I wrote Friends, that was a lyric that my wife wrote and I wrote the music to it, but I would say, 98% of the time it's a melody and you, you know, you just sort of, every time I sort of try to write something great, it's a, it's a disaster. Honestly, um, I'm not very good at, at getting together with a bunch of writers and we're going to write a hit song at 10 AM on Friday morning. That's never worked for me. Um, mm -hmm. but really it's the melody. It's a melody that comes and you kind of know, you kind of know what that melody is sort of, uh, saying in some ways because most of the time when I do write something for the most part I know what the song needs to be about and then I pull in the poets I pull in all the great 
lyric writers that I respect so much and, um, and let them help me hash all that out and try to figure out how we can come up with something beautiful, a beautiful marriage of a melody and a mm-hmm. lyric. And you've, you've led so many people in worship, myself included, um, just tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in, in arenas. Michael, what do you think is the special role that worship music plays in our relationship with God? Hey, it's, it's what we're made to do. It's what we were created to do, to worship God. And mm-hmm. for me as a worship leader, when I hit the stage, I'm going, God, uh, what, what's my posture? And I want my posture to be beautiful, and I want to walk out, to, out there with extreme humility, and this is not about me. And that's hard for me a little bit because it's been, you know, a lot of people still look at me as celebrity, and I, and I don't like that, you know. So you have to sort of diffuse that. And I think if it's authentic, people are looking for authenticity. And I think when they look up there and going, okay, I can follow this guy because I know it's not, he knows it's not about himself, you know? And so I think you, when you project that, um, then people can follow you. And then my role is to change the atmosphere and to create a space where God meets people. Mm. And then, you know, you never know what's going to happen at that point, especially when there's a, there's a shift in the atmosphere. There's a, you feel like there's a breakthrough. You just kind of sense it in your spirit. And man, sometimes I'm just, I feel like I'm not in control. I'm not even hanging onto the reins. This thing takes off and it's like, it literally can literally wipe you out emotionally. Yeah. And I've seen it happen not only here in America, but all around the world. Wow, what, what, what a privilege that is. Michael, when I think of the arts, sometimes the arts f- uh, serve as a way of, for people to escape from their burdens and the stresses in their life. I go see a movie and I can escape and I go into this fantasy world, but worship, arts are interesting in that people pick up their burdens and their stressors and they they bring them to God through worship. In fact, I saw that last night at a Carrie Job concert that I was at and you could just see people and they were just they were weeping. Their burdens and their stresses were were right there and they're bringing them to the to the feet of God. How have you seen worship be a change agent in people's lives? Well, it's captivating. You know, you can walk in with a a load of burdens and a load of stuff that you feel like, man, I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, uh, people are desperate uh, for answers. And then something breaks in the atmosphere and something, it's it's miraculous. I can't really, Kirk, I honestly can't explain it. It's, I mean, it's, the, it's supernatural to me. Mm. But something breaks. And it's what you pray for every night. Something breaks, and you have somebody who's come in who's suicidal or yeah. who t- is just ready to end it all, and then something shifts, and all of a sudden they're weeping. They're literally weeping on the floor, and God meets them where they're at. Wow. And you get, a, you get a sense going, you know what? I'm going to be okay. And... He's going to turn this for the good, even though I don't understand it. Even what I always I love that song, Sovereign Over Us, even what the enemy means for evil, he turns it for the good. Yeah. He always does. One of the things that I love about some contemporary worship music right now is the, the singing back to God who he is in our lives. The, the affirmation of the role that he plays, like Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, um, awesome God, uh, above all powers, above all things. Michael, what do you think that that kind of worship does for us by reminding us who God is? Well, I think you said it. It's just a reminder. I kind of feel like when I go out every night, I'm not, I feel like we don't need to probably tell very many people something new because it's already there. I'm just, I feel like I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor to all these people who come, I'm just reminding them of what the book says. Yeah. And, and really that's it. And then when you fully understand, when you get this whole thing about, as I said earlier, that God not only loves you, but he likes you and he calls you his own. And there's a destiny on your life. It, at some point it's going to like completely change your life and the way you look at things, the way you see people, the way all, all of a sudden you realize, Oh my gosh, it's not about me. It's not about me. And hmm. when you start to turn your affections and your and your adoration to the maker, I'm telling you what, it's a game changer. Yeah. 
how can we be praying for our local worship teams at church? What is, the, what is it that you think that they need, being, being the, 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 the veteran worship leader that you are? I think we need some moms and dads out there, Kirk. You know, we need mothers and fathers to father this next generation and mother this next generation of worship leaders. There's some really wonderful things going on, and I love that. Um, you know, I, I think it's always a challenge when you, uh, especially in big churches, and you got lights and you got sound and you yeah. got all the da 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 right. bells and whistles. And sometimes I think we can we can sort of get lost in that and lose our focus a little bit and we're dazzled by all that. And man, some of the best worship times I've been in was somebody just playing the piano or the guitar all by themselves and everything is stripped away. Uh, I'm not saying there's, there's nothing, I'm not saying lights are bad and production is bad. I'm just saying, I think there's gotta be a, we have to really be careful about dazzling people and we have to, bring people to the into the presence of God. Yeah. And we don't do that with all the production. We do that with authenticity and having the ability and the gift to tap into what sort of, it's almost like you're sensing in your spirit what's happening in the room. And, oh gosh, there's something happening in the room. Then maybe we don't stick with the set list. Maybe we stay on the song. And I think we get into this whole thing where we're programmed. We got 25 minutes of worship. We got 20 minutes of sermon. And again, I'm 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 not being judgmental. I'm just saying, I just think God wants to do something fresh and new. And I think that there's got to be a, there's got to be something that that feels free. Yeah. To let God sort of control what's going on in the meeting. Again, I've opened up a can of worms there, Kirk. But. <laughs> <laughs> but well, M- Michael, what, what I'm what I'm taking away from what you're saying, though, and I so appreciate this about you personally, is that even though you are an artist, even though you are a performer, even though we can come to a spectacular co- uh, con- concert, you yourself are an authentic person. God is is an authentic person, and I think that is what people are really starving for today: is authenticity and genuineness, particularly from those who are leading us in our churches as spiritual shepherds, as worship leaders. So thank you for, for being such a great role model, not only for young worship leaders, but uh, for all of us believers. 